Humanity faces a lot of problems. Smaller problems, such as a dead battery on your telephone, but also bigger problems, so-called wicked problems. And Tilburg University offers the GMSI program, Global Management of Social Issues. And Global Management of Social Issues deals with wicked problems. And today we will talk about poverty, which might as well be the wickedest problem of them all. How does it work? And most of all, what can we do about it? And we're going to talk with three people. And the first one is Rodrigo Reyes. He is from Peru. He's a first year student of the GMSI program. And well, you studied in a lot of places, uh, New York, Warsaw, Lima, and of course now here in Tilburg. The second one in the middle, Caroline de Wilde, Dr. Caroline de Wilde. She's from Belgium and she's the Associate Professor of Sociology and the coordinator of the course Wicked Problems 101. And she teaches on inequality, poverty and comparative social policy. And last but not least, we have Adrian Rupke. He's a first year student from Germany and his ambition, and I quote, is to build communities and network networks to tackle wicked problems and to participate in a great transformation towards non-destructive ways of living on earth. Whew. Adrian, that's a big thing. Yeah. Are you like the new messiahs? No, no, no. I'm just, as I said, I want to participate and I think to tackle those wicked problems and to find solutions, we all need to unleash our passions and gifts and it's like about movements, it's about us getting together and doing it. And I just want to participate and contribute in that process. Well, so, so that's your passion, Adrian. Uh, Carolina, what is your passion for teaching at GMSI, at the GMSI program? Well, yeah, first of all, I like teaching for the GMSI program because it's about poverty and inequality. And it's like, it's what I'm most uh, interested in. And it's also nice to be able to um, you know, give my knowledge uh, to the students. And I think what I particularly like about this program is that a lot of the students are intri intrinsically motivated. So they come to the Netherlands, or they are from the Netherlands, and they come to Tilburg uh, to study, and they want to know more about it. So I thought the classes were very inspiring because they, you know, they're just interested in it. And for a teacher, that's the nicest thing that you can uh, that you can achieve. So you've right? got the best that students in the world. That people do not only come to have the six, but that people also <laughs> want to have high grades and are intrinsically interested in the topic. Nice. And and your specialty or your uh, point of interest is poverty. Yes. W when did that uh, start? Uh, I think that I, yeah, I, I think that's hard to say. I mean, I've always been interested in uh, equal opportunities or unequal uh, opportunities to start with. So I don't know. I have always had this interest. Uh, You're just a human being. Exactly, maybe, yeah. yes. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, I just, I value social justice, I guess. Yeah, and you value it so much that you also were a member of Greenpeace. Uh, yes, exactly. And what, what did you do at Greenpeace? Oh, God. That no. was when I really was like, uh, you know, 12 or 14 or something like that. We posted leaflets all over the village uh, with my best friend. So we drove, we did, uh, we literally did like the whole village. So, nice. <laughs> so we were chased by farm dogs and stuff like that. <laughs> so you're an so activist. That's, that's something that we did, yes. A very young activist. Rodrigo, um, well, you basically studied at a lot of different places. Um, Poverty. Have you encountered poverty in, in one of those countries where you studied? Yeah, I think that the most, um, how do you say, direct uh, example of poverty you can get in Peru, where a developing country, there is still a lot of poverty, especially in the interior. In the interior. So I think that I've been acquainted with it, and that's why I would like to try to solve it. Try to or solve it. Resolve it. Learn, learn things here take it back to Peru and solve poverty there. Well, perhaps not solve it, mm. but try to <laughs> And we'll talk make about that, how to, how to solve poverty in a, in a minute. First, let's start with wicked problems. Uh, Carolina, yes. what, what is the definition of a wicked problem? Yes, that's kind of, um, it's not so easy, but basically there's a number of characteristics. And wicked problems are really about complex social issues. And um, because they're social, that makes it complex, I guess you could say and they are characterized by a great level of uncertainty. And that basically means that it's already hard to know what the problem is or to define it or to measure it. So we could say that's uncertain then, or if you devise policies for it, it's hard to know what the outcome of a policy will be because you don't really know what, how to deal with the problem exactly. So, so that makes it uncertain. And is there a solution to a wicked problem? Is, is it 
Yeah, I think uh, from all the different uh, disciplines, there's a lot of uh, solutions being formulated. It depends a bit what kind of discipline and what level. Uh, political sciences looks at uh, societies, for instance, and sociology or psychology looks at persons. So there's a lot of, you could say, part solutions in terms of how research can contribute to formulating uh, policies. And um, Adrian, what are different kinds of wicked problems that you discuss in lecture? We've got poverty, of course, but what are other uh, examples? Yes, yeah, so now in the first year we mainly had poverty and inequality. Um, next year it will be about migration. And in the third year it's really about, okay, what can we do now? What interventions can you do about wicked problems? And outside the course we are, of course, discussing also like climate change and and different other topics. Other yeah. wicked problems. Yeah. Well, now we're going to talk about poverty, ladies and gentlemen. And, um, well, uh, why is poverty a wicked problem, Rodrigo? Well, as Dr. De Wilde said, um, well, because it's a very complex problem, because it is embedded in society. So you have, for example, different actors or different leverage points where you could tackle the problem. You also have a great degree of uncertainty because you don't know if, as she, as she said, if you um, create or try to tackle it with a policy, you don't know how that's going to end up in the future. So you don't know which, how do I say it, um, perhaps you don't know um, where it's going to have more impact, what the effects are going to be. So the effects are immeasurable. They're usually transboundary. And also you have the problem of you have different um, ideologies. So perhaps you're a liberal and you think that uh, the market should take, for, should take care of this problem. Or perhaps you're more... Um, or progressive, and you tackle it through the welfare state, for example. Well, I hear a lot of things, uh, the politics, the, the internationality of the problem. Um, so, but in lecture, where do you begin, Adrian? What's the first thing that you do if you hear the wicked problem poverty? Yeah, yeah. we first had a look at the history, so how was poverty looked at and tackled uh, throughout, throughout the times? and how that also changed. And then, uh, well, what Rodrigo already said, like what are the different ideologies? Um, what are different measurements of poverty? Because that's where it begins. How do we define a problem? Mm -hmm. And um, that's how we kind of got closer to, OK, what is poverty about? And what kind of perspectives can you take on the problem? And wh what is your perspective on the problem? Where do you start? Uh, yeah, like if we go for <laughs> ideological difference or what Rodrigo was saying, I'm uh, very much, I, I find it quite ridiculous that we are on a planet of abundance that we don't manage to distribute our resources and and our wealth in a way that people are millions of people are not suffering so and i would say we have the means to do it but there are simply also powerful interests which are profiting from poverty as as uh, hard as that gets and always when i see people on the streets with uh, with those empty eyes are kind of being devastated, I also always have like a strong empathetic reaction and I'm like, what are we doing? Yeah. So you really want to change it. Yeah. And, but it, is it, isn't that easy to say, okay, we can just redistribute wealth and then that's it? Caroline well, de Wilde? I, I guess, um, as any sociologist will tell you, um, every society has a certain level of inequality, right? And the bottom line really is, how large do we let this inequality be? And another uh, point is the people at the bottom, how, how bad are they? Because you can have an unequal society where everybody's still quite well off, or you can, have, um, you can have an unequal society where people at the bottom are hungry, essentially. And really, all, like, it, it's, if you have unequal distribution of resources, the people who have the resources usually have the power and try to keep the power. That's essentially how it's always been all over, uh, you know, throughout history. So you need to redistribute in order to make sure that the pe people at the bottom have enough. Yeah, and, and, and so... You, it, it's always a political... Poverty is a political choice. And we see in Europe as well that um, we've chosen over the course of the 20th century to build a big welfare state which takes care of most people uh, in a relatively adequate way. And you see, for instance, that in large welfare states, poverty rates are lower than in small welfare states. Yes, so, so the poverty is different in the Netherlands than, for instance, in Peru. Oh, yes. Exactly. Most definitely. Yeah. Uh, but can you say that there are no poor people then in the, in the Netherlands? Or how do you define 
well, you, it's, it's how you define it, I guess. Like, yeah. Because you, you, well, you have absolute poverty, and you also have relative poverty. You could say that here, rel people are, can be relatively poor mm -hmm. because, because of context. But uh, in Peru, I would say that there is much more absolute poverty, where people cannot uh, afford to survive. So, but it then just changed the definition of poverty and the, uh, the solution is there, right? Yeah, it depends. I, I think, um, but, but it depends also how you define basic needs and that's also evolved a bit through history. And we started out with this concept of poverty that basic needs are that you need to have enough to survive, right? But in a country like the Netherlands, you could also argue that a basic need is that you have enough to be accepted socially in society. And this is exactly, so you can have a strict definition of basic needs, but you could also have a more, you know, relative one. And we all need Wi-Fi, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. We all <laughs> need Wi-Fi. It's a necessity. But your life would be very hard if you would not be able to afford it in the Netherlands, because it would be very hard to apply for unemployment benefit, for instance. That's, that's true. And things so like that. But I was um, plugging into this because now it's, again about definitions and about this more scientific perspective but when you ask me is there poverty in the Netherlands I can say like I know uh, a person here I just met him on the streets he's living in the forest he was in the winter he was there like freezing when I met him on the streets he was like always tired you know and I tried to help him out with with money and whatever but he's he doesn't have a he doesn't have a flat so that's also absolute poverty in a way like right b b among us and that's where and, and that's where I agree with you. It's a political thing, and um, it's not only uh, it's not only the state or the government which is like doing policies, but it's really about us. I think like civil society trying to do something about it. And and uh, well, we, we know that you are trying to change it with by yourself. You know, helping this this man uh, who is, who lives in the forest who doesn't have a roof over over his head. Uh, how can you change? Uh, politics as a student of GMSI, what, what can you do about it? Well, I think like if you think I'm on my own, then your, your potential to change something won't be that high. But I'm saying like millions of people and organizations and networks all over the planet are trying to tackle those problems in very creative ways by now. So you can just join there. I think that would be the first thing because there are people doing that for all their life. And if you want to have an impact, Look, look out for them, and then try to try to fit in there. So you don't have to do it all by yourself. And how do these organizations change politics then? Because it's a political problem. We 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 just heard. Yeah. And what do these organizations do to change uh, the way people think? Yeah. The way politicians think. That's a that's a good question. Um, I think, like at the moment, we have the, not two, but those. Um, Bigger projects with like the foreign aid, for example, you go to a country in the global south and you just um, put out food packages or something, which kind of makes them dependent on you. You know, you have this dependency going on, and it's partly also, you know, corruption comes in and self-interest of other states. But I um, was researching in the context of our course um, about like an organization which is taking a more empowering approach. So they are really he helping the people to help themselves. And I think there, where, there, that's where it starts. If you get the people who are in poverty active to kind of help themselves and you facilitate that. I still hear you saying how the, these uh, organizations help the people, but how do these organizations change the politics? Because politics create poverty, yeah. but what do they do to change it upwards? Yeah. Uh, maybe somebody else has got an ID? Yeah, and awareness, for instance. Uh -huh. so I think um, voluntary organizations can also do lobby work. But, uh, but then for that again, they need to know how to do that. So and as a scientist, you uh, provide the data and the facts. Science, you provide the data and the facts, but if you study, for instance, uh, political science and you or international relations, then you learn to know how to do this, how to actually have try and have an influence. And uh, what, what, what was your influence? Because, of course, <laughs> as you are the scientist on the table yeah. and you, you res you've done research, of course, and you've got data. What, 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 say, yeah. what was the last thing that you've changed in, uh, in politics? Oh God, no, um, as, a, as a student, I was actually active in Greenpeace and with, at Oxfam. Mm -hmm. I kind of helped to found this, you know, one of those shops, Wereldwinkels, where you uh, sell stuff. Mm -hmm. But then it kind of, you know, I have a full-time job and a family now. <laughs> but um, yeah, anyway, I mean, my, my 
I'm kind of involved with the research that I do also because I think it is worthwhile. And actually the, the, the thing that I do is that academics often do not write for non-academics, but if an organization asks me to write something about my research in simple language for, you know, a Dutch public or Flemish because I'm Belgium or for the EU, then I will always do this. Okay. So that's how I try to contribute then. Yeah, Adam, that's actually of Adrian, sorry. Yeah, that's actually really good because when I came here, like my first months here, was like you have this detached kind of scientific angle and I was, I, I remember, writing about uh, people being raped in India and you just have this, yeah, okay, what's the problem now? And I was like, ah, ah, like, yeah. and, and that's, that's really, I think, one major flaw of science nowadays that they are not uh, approaching uh, again, like the problems again, you know, like you can write a 10, 10 paper, a uh, 10 pages paper and then have a policy advice, but that's not having, that's not having a major impact on the problem. And because you have this um, separation of science and people actually doing something, we get really knowledge, which is just relevant for the scientists. And that's like, there I'm, yeah. So what, what, is your <laughs> what is your advice for the future GMSI student? Always focus on the human side of science, always yeah. focus on the humans yeah. or yeah, what I it's guess about? I in a sense what you're saying is correct, but it's very much, you can make a choice in that yourself as a researcher and as a student, because I mean my main interest is social change and how particularly welfare states change and how that uh, changes the well-being of people in those welfare states, you know, um, increase in homelessness for instance. So as a researcher, even though you have this detached method, so to speak, you can still be involved by the choice of your topic. You do not have to yeah, study something yeah. that is not irrelevant in your eyes if you do not want to. So, yeah. Just yeah. follow the yeah. heart and do what, what you can do to change, for instance, this wicked yes, problem of poverty. Exactly. Um, one thing about poverty, and um, Adrian, um, it, it is related to a lot of other, other wicked problems, for instance, migration, which yeah. uh, people migrate because of poverty. Uh, we see that a new refugee is, is rising, the, the climate change refugee. Yeah. Um, so is, is poverty then the biggest wicked, wicked problem of them all? Uh, I don't know if you can say that, but it's really more about the inter interconnection. And I have, a, I have a story for that. So I was like uh, traveling and I was like in the night in Cologne, a German city at the, at the train station. And I saw like this woman, uh, really again, really empty eyes and having a picture of her two children begging uh, for money. So I was, I was approaching her, uh, giving her some money, wanting to help out. And then you see like she was a Kurd. So you have the wicked problem of the political repression in the, in the country where she's coming from. Mm -hmm. Then I hear behind my back someone from Germany saying, um, yeah, she has enough money, you know, like one of those statements which you more and more get. So you have the wicked problem of like rising populism again, you know. And then I was talking to him and um, so I, I approached him like, why would you say something like that? And uh, then he was like, yeah, I'm a little bit uh, disabled. And then I saw also his pain. And then you have poverty on his side, you have poverty on the side of the migrant, you have the migration, you have the political repression, and that's how it, they get together in a story. And then you're like in the middle of it and trying to help out and understand, and it's like... <laughs> it is a lot, it yeah. is a lot. And, and, and then again, the question, where do you start? If you, if you want to solve such a big problem with all these wicked problems um, g coming together, where do you begin? I think it's like starts with yourself that you take a conscious decision of I will change something and then you just look like what, what are your passions, like where are you going to and then you, you find up, you ally up with other people. And there is one thing that you have started which was you did something in Tilburg, yeah, you created yeah. a we, network? Yeah, we are kind of part of Transform Tilburg uh, which is like a kind of community organization and we are trying to bring together different organizations working on different issues to learn from each other, to get into action together and um, facilitating that network in a way, yeah. So you can really change something, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just a question, because uh, of course you guys um, are in a lecture room together and uh, in a lecture room students ask questions to the, te to the teacher. Um, what, would, what, what, what kind of question would you like to ask uh, Caroline uh, regarding poverty? What was the question you'd, you'd ask? Well, I, I was a bit um, surprised or um, 
by 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 the statement of like the sorry, the fact that you said that poverty is a uh, is a political a political problem. It's just like yeah. it's just a political decision, and that that's actually very. I don't know. I don't see it that way. Okay. You know, I I I don't think it's a matter of of, of politics. And w what's the question in? So like, why would you say it's a, it's a it's a political decision? Because, yeah, I mean, of course, there's a number of external circumstances that cause poverty, right? If it doesn't rain for so many years in Africa, then you will have poverty because... But essentially, in, in societies, um, it's, it's just always the case that resources are not distributed equally. And this kind of tends to perpetuate because um, the, the groups that are better off, they try to protect their privileges for themselves and then also for their children, eh? if mm -hmm. you look at it's a bit of a, a simplistic example, but African dictators, they often tend to give that dictatorship to their children, actually. Oh, or so you kind of have these dynasties, even with presidents, they do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I have a George W. Bush and then um, his, his father. father and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. So Which that's kind of the way it works. And if you don't make the conscious decision as a society through all kind of mechanisms like I guess voluntary organizations, unions started out like that, you know, to protect workers. That was essentially their first voluntary organizations, and then there were unions, and then they become social partners. So, and all these um, institutions are basically aimed at redistributing resources mm -hmm. to ensure that the people at the bottom are also included. And it, I mean, it's. And that's where the politics, that's where the politics come in. Yeah. I, mean, I think it, it, it strikes me because and when... Just, yeah. is, is this the way it works in a lecture? Is this how <laughs> it goes? The discussion between student and teacher? Yeah. Uh, it's, getting, it's getting there. Like in the first months it was like students a little bit more, more shy, I guess, but that's normal. But now we are getting more in the mode and of discussing. Yeah, and I, I, I think that the, the classes become much more um, vivid or much more interesting when you have yeah. these type of dis yeah. discussions. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think it's it's much encouraged by the the, the lecture. And it's a necessity yeah. to solve these kind of problems, of course, to have yeah. a discussion about yeah. it. Yeah. And yeah. of course, the teacher gets an opportunity to ask the, the students a question as well, because yeah. we want a, <laughs> maybe a, some sort of exam. What would you like to uh, ask the, the students, Carolina? Well, I don't know. They already passed the exam. <laughs> it's <laughs> excellent. So. Excellent. <laughs> So, so and they also like said a lot of things which I recognize. So I'm kind of happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> so a me, lecture, me just, that's the best thing you can have, right? Okay. So let so. me just rephrase the question. What 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 was what is a good example that they did at the table? What, what were you proud of? Um, what was I proud of? Um, well, I think they actually that. Um, able to put scientific knowledge, so the things that we learned in class, they're able to apply this to like either examples or to questions that they have, and I think this is very good. This is what universities want to achieve. Excellent. Right? And of course to prepare them for the future. Well, you've said a lot about the future, about things that you are going to do. Um, what are you going to do when, once you've graduated? What's the next step? Uh, that's, yeah, that's an interesting question. I want to be a broker of social movements, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is like... So no, no stock exchange broker, nothing no, to no, do no, with no, that? No. Yeah, but it's, it's really interesting because for collaborations between those very different movements or, or organizations, you really need someone in between who is familiar with the language and what they are doing and what their projects are, and then to strategically connect them to each other. And because those wicked problems are so interconnected and we need those networks, we need, need someone who is responsible to create those networks. And uh, that's where I see myself uh, going, yeah. Nice, creating networks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Caroline, because um, poverty is one of your focus points, what's the next uh, part of this uh, wicked problem that you are going to study? Right, so I actually just finished a large research project about uh, changes on housing markets and how it is linked to inequality. And I kind of wrote a new, or in the beginnings of writing a new research proposal, which is actually about the politics of poverty. And I kind of want to reanalyze poverty trends of the last 25 years and kind of look how, not only how welfare states have changed, but also how things, for instance, what I know from my research on housing markets and also a lot of other research is that 
um, a lot of things in society are changing so that if we only look at poverty as an income problem, which is what mm -hmm. we do in Europe, we kind of see a small increase, but not very much. But if you look at, for instance, the increase in housing costs and food costs and energy costs, the poor are actually spending a lot more of their limited resources than they did 20 years ago. And you see this in all European countries. You see an increase in homelessness in all European countries the last five years. And I think this is not only something that is linked to the economic crisis, but it is linked to a much larger trend. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to remake the case that poverty is a much broader problem than just an income problem. And I want to reanalyze uh, this whole politics of poverty process of the last 25 years. But I need to find funding for that. So. Well, so if <laughs> you've got first, a bag of money uh, <laughs> lying at yes. home. Um, well, Rodrigo, we talked, of course, in the introduction about Peru and the poverty situation there. Now, you would like to change that. Um, we hear that po there are a lot of elements working with poverty, but where would you start? What would you do? In Peru, I would say that it's, uh, it's a matter of education so, and, and access, especially access to education, because you mm -hmm. see that in, in a lot of places, um, the only option that people have is a state education. And perhaps that's not bad here in, the, in, in Europe, because state education is very good, or in the, develop, um, sorry, or in the developed world, it's not bad. But in Peru, you see a very, a very big gap between, for example, private institutions, uh, edu mm -hmm. edu educative institutions, if you can say that, and uh, and national. So I would say that, yeah, I would start with that. Either reform in the, the. <laughs> I know it's, it 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 sounds very big and all that. I, I can I can make it. I think tomorrow, education is a very important <laughs> step for people to yeah. grow out of poverty. But we hear a lot of other options as well. For yeah. instance, housing or income. But, but you say in Peru we need to start with education. Exactly. But it, that that's also the I would say the nice thing about wicked problems like. Whenever, for example, I'm doing this, I, I'm, I'm saying that poverty is, has its root in education, but I could also say that it has its root in, in income. But I could also say that um, the income is bad or the income is not enough because people are not highly educated. Or I could say that, um, <laughs> or I could say that th their, their education is bad because they don't have enough income. Yeah, I guess yes. it so where do you start? The context. So yeah. from theory and social policy, there's also this idea that there's like key interventions, right? And what you're saying is in Peru, the key intervention is education, but in an African country, it might be healthcare to start yeah. with. Or so, so there are different solutions different, for poverty in different areas. It depends on how you define it, or yeah. Yeah, how do you define it depending on the context too. Yeah. Exactly, yes. And so you, you'd like to work with, uh, in, in Peru with education, well, it's uh, well. I, I don't know if I would like to directly contribute with that, but I would say that uh, if if you uh, how do you say shatter, shatter the barriers that poor people have with uh, ha uh, good quality education, then you would make a step forward. Okay. Because, and yeah. what would you do in Peru? Well, because what, what's your next step? I mean, well, my next step. Well, I don't know. Like I. I I would like to go into research, I think, or I would also like to go into con consultancy, because, for example, in Peru we have a lot of problems with extractive companies. They have a really, really bad reputation. Uh, for with people who extractive companies, what is that? Mining, okay. for example. Yeah. We have Peru is a very resourceful country, but uh, you you have a lot of inequality there. Mm -hmm. But um, for example, these these extractive companies have a lot of conflicts with uh, local communities, so there is a mismanage of of stakeholders of relationships with them i would like to try to help there they from a consultancy part point of view creating the network with the company and yeah. the society which could benefit from the company I, of course i i think that it's a uh, yeah if you manage that well that relationship that you have well then both um both uh, it's a win-win situation i think because right now you have a I don't know, you have a lot of projects, for example, that are completely, um, I don't know if to say paralyzed, mm -hmm. or like, it's just no go. And communities lose jobs, for example, and the company loses millions of money because they, they cannot operate. So, and you're going to make it better and create the win-win situation between like the companies that, yeah. and the... Because I believe in cooperation, and I believe that cooperation leads, leads as you say, to a win-win um, situation. Yeah. Are you going back to Peru? 
Oh yeah. yeah is yeah. that the there you're going to solve poverty there? <laughs> or actually try to to try. solve it? Yeah. Of course. But um, yeah, I I would like to because the the thing is like if I I went out because I sorry I left Peru because I think that um, I could get much more knowledge here, mm -hmm. or I could take from the good practices that welfare states have, or uh, and already in industrialized uh, com uh, societies have, or just uh, I don't know. Yeah, I could I could take those examples and try to to get them to Peru. Yeah. So yeah, in the future I would like to come back. And in the third year, you've got your um, well your possibilities to go abroad. Yeah. What are you going to do then? Well, Have you got a plan already? Or I was thinking about it. I, I don't know if I'm going to go abroad, but I was looking into a, a minor of ethics. Okay, minor of ethics. Yeah. Well, you're not going abroad, of course, Carolina, but you will. Yeah. Where are you going? I'm drawn to make an internship in South America somewhere. Nice. Just one more question for the scientists. Maybe it's, it's a completely different subject, but um, I find it difficult because I'm, I'm a Western, I come from a developed area, of course, in the world. Um, I find it very difficult to look with uh, open perspective to poverty because, yeah. y I mean, you, Carolina, also you come from Belgium, which is a developed. Isn't it very easy to say as an educated person, well, we'll solve this problem and we'll do it like this? Well, yeah, but I, I don't think we I don't think we say that actually. <laughs> I think we do research to try to understand the problem better and to help policymakers trying to do something. But it's it's not like you say. I don't I don't think scientists have the idea that they will have like this end solution or anything. So. And especially but not with the, just the Western perspective. You need to have an yeah, open I, mind. Yeah, I think it, it, it's tricky when you look at poverty in a Western perspective, but I think the way we've been, I think the way we, we look at it nowadays is basically this, um, this whole idea that basic needs are not only about your material needs, but about your social needs. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, if there's hunger and starvation, you always have poverty, right? And then this idea that the social part is more relative is actually um, developed by a Nobel Prize winner of Indian descent, Amartya Sen, who is a scholar in Oxford University. But he kind of said, you know, that he actually said we cannot look in poverty in different ways in the Western world and in the, and the uh, less developed world. You know, it's not fair. And he came up with this framework. And I think even though you can have a lot of criticism on it, it's, it's a good framework to work in. And then you have to. Yeah, the, the, and there is some something. criticism because um, the UN, one question is how are we going to solve uh, hunger in the African part of the world or the, uh, the yeah. poorer parts in the world? And then you see like the Western community saying, What's, what's, what's uh, hunger? You see uh, America saying, what's the rest of the world? You see, it's, it's a comic, of course. Um, so uh, how, how would you approach such uh, uh, a different kind of perspective? Yeah. Not a very good question, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think like, it, it comes in like this top-down kind of approach of us being the self-righteous uh, people who figured it all out. You know, we call ourselves developed, but what the hell is developed? Uh, and then you kind of go into other countries and you get this, that, like that you create dependencies that you say, okay, this is the main issues, but you don't even ask the people who are really suffering from poverty. So I don't know exactly what the pathways are, but like getting from our high horse of saying we figured it out and democracy, it's working with us, you know, and uh, yeah, I, I'm really favoring movements, you know, like the people making the change because I don't expect uh, governments and p um, private corporations um, to make the changes. Well, and let's end with that. People making the change. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for looking and uh, thank you for all your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.